Hello and welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 533rd New Social Environment. I'm Carolyn, the Programs Associate here at The Rail, and I have the privilege of being your MC today for a conversation featuring George Gittos, Helen Rose, and David Le Levi Strauss. We're thrilled to welcome poet Jenya Turevskaya here to close today's program. Before we get started, the Brooklyn Rail acknowledges Black Lives Matter and that here in New York, we are on Lenape Hoking, the unceded land and waters of the Wappinger, Canarsie, Muncie, and Lenny Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and Shinnecock Indian Nation. We encourage you to check the chat for a working document of resources and actions. Over the past 22 years, the Brooklyn Rail has undertaken a miraculous journey, bringing together in a single monthly publication art, music, dance, film, theater, and literature, along with thoughtful social and political meditations. As a small nonprofit, we need your support. Your contribution will directly support our writers, guest artists, production staff, and operations here at the Rail. Please check the chat for more information and links to donate. And now to introduce today's guests and hosts. Described simultaneously as a figurative painter, a modernist, a postmodernist, a social realist, a pop artist, and an expressionist, George Gittos is an eyewitness in the world's contact zones. Gittos has received multiple awards and recognitions, including an honorary doctor of letters by the University of NSW and the Blake Prize for Religious Art. Helen Rose has worked as a performance artist, singer, writer, and actor for nearly 30 years. She's recorded and performed with famous Australian musicians such as Mick Harvey, Jim Mogany, Tex Perkins, Doc Neeson, among others. Along with George Gittos, she's co-founder of the Yellow House Jalalabad and the Yellow House Southside Chicago. She's an assistant director and actor on five Pashtun dramas made in Pakistan and Afghanistan, and is the first European woman to appear in Pashtun films. Her projects include award-winning documentaries, Love City, Jalalabad, Snow Monkey, White Light, and Haunted Burka. She is currently working with musicians in Kiev, Ukraine, as well as producing a documentary, Love in War, with George Gittos. David Lee Weistrauss's work focuses on the intersection between image and text and the third space that is created through that interaction. He's the author of multiple books, including Between the Eyes, Essays on Photography and Politics from Aperture, and his latest work is Co-Illusion, Dispatches from the End of Communication from MIT Press. And with that, I will turn it over to our very own Fang Bui for a special introduction. Thank you so much. Welcome everyone. Hello friends, hello colleagues. Uh, at the Russia-Ukraine war enter today, 43rd day today, I think. I'm coming to you from my friend Julian's gallery, Locks Gallery in Philadelphia. And I was thinking on my way to come in here, how Alexis de Tocqueville in his essential observation of America being one half that belongs to the tyranny of the minority, which refers to the old European model of monarchy, and the other half belong to the tyranny of the mass <laughs> that aspire to basic in, you know, equality, which by nature is inherently opposed to the notion of rule. Of the, for rule itself had always been, I would say, subjected to partisanship. In other words, if there's no space in the middle from which people can come together, what Tocqueville refer as the art of joining, to talk and to share what's on their mind, you know, what the urgent topic of the current affairs during even the, you know, difficult times or even during peacetime to give back to the community by building a church for those who worship or building a school for children to go to. So having witnessed, I would say two ruptures, the pandemic, and the ongoing crisis of our social political condition implemented in part by those who know how to deploy technology with speed, creating chaos and anxiety for self-serving purposes. We need those, I mean, our fellow men and women who can really hold firmly the ground of the space in the middle more now than ever. 
I mean, by that, I mean holding firmly this ground, the space in the middle means at the moment, I can think of the activation of John Kitch's term, negative capability, how to subvert the most difficult condition, you know, live in uncertainty, monumental uncertainty, I would say, into a form of cosmic beauty through art and poetry. I can think of also Hannah Arendt's term, thinking without the banister, how to walk up and down the stair without the need to rest in our hands on the handrail. Yes, at the moment I'm thinking of what Levi's late friend, George, late friend, as well as mine, the great painter Leon Gullet, whose life work, as you know, has been invested in the subject of war and violence among all the human conflict and oppression. One says, he did say this to all of us, monster exists because we create them through war and violence and distortion and the way we handle people and so on. And I can't help but to think it also what Sartanissen also wrote in his classic, the Gulag, Apinkalago, you know, what was it, the day 1818 to maybe five, 1956, I think. If only it was so simple, if only there were evil people somewhere insidiously committing evil deeds and it were necessary only to separate them from the rest of us and destroy them. But the lie dividing good and evil cuts through the heart of every human being and who is willing to destroy a piece of his own heart. I must say, there have been rare individuals who can thrive in such wondrous conviction on this on the spot condition in order to activate that middle space. What our friend Peter Limbaugh was and also known as Hakim Bay called temporary autonomous zone. Indeed, our friends, George and Helen are those who feel they were born to undertake this karma this journey, they simply surrender to their reincarnation or transmigration of how karma itself as an idea embraces the philosophy of action and reaction which governs life itself. I put it there, I can talk further, but I have to go to a meeting. So here I pass the mic to you, Levi. Have a great conversation, you guys. Ciao. Thanks. Thanks, Fong. Um, I want to just give a little a little more context here. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so in May of 2004, I was in Leon Golub's studio on LaGuardia Place talking with him about the torture images from Abu Ghraib that had just appeared. And he said he wanted to show me a new film by an Australian filmmaker, artist, friend of his named George Gittas. It was the first time I'd heard that name. Uh, and it was a film of George wandering around Iraq talking with US soldiers. And his first question was always, well, what are you listening to? And it, as it turned out, they were all listening to something and, and had deep uh, opinions and feelings about that. And as he talked to them, um, they began to say other things about what was happening in Iraq. And uh, it became very, um, uh, the film was extraordinary. Some of you have, seen it whether you know that you've seen it or not because parts of it were in uh, Fahrenheit 9-11 Michael Moore's film but um, I thought of this film when I heard Zelensky say a few days ago what is more opposite to music the silence of ruined cities and killed people so 
uh, George and Helen have been in war zones all over the world, uh, George for most of his life, uh, and as Fong said, and, and he and Helen decided to go to Ukraine to show solidarity with the Ukrainian people and to make a film. Uh, and they arrived in Kyiv March 23rd, so I think that's been 16 days. And a lot has happened over that time around Kyiv since the original invasion on February 24th. Um, the Russians first hit the Hostomel airport with helicopters and met stiff resistance, then a column of trucks and, and track vehicles drove straight down one of the main avenues through Kyiv and they were forced to retreat. Uh, then they decided to surround the city with two bands, one close in and one further out, uh, and they couldn't stop supplies or incursions. And in the meantime, they carpet bombed the towns outside of Kyiv, around Kyiv. And uh, this week, the Ukrainians took back those towns and villages and found extensive evidence of atrocities by the Russians. So the, in, in some sense, the first battle of Kyiv is over and the Ukrainians held the line. And now the Russians haven't been able to move into Kharkiv. Uh, they're concentrating on, on the east. Uh, one of the first things you said to me, George, we've been in contact since you've been there by email. And one of the first things you said to me that I remember when you got to Kyiv was that everyone that you talked to said, this is World War III. Uh, but why didn't the rest of the world realize that this is World War III, that it's already started? And I've come to agree with these people. Um, Putin is a fascist. His entire absurd story that he's giving about uh, the reason for the invasion is a fascist story. It's right out of the fascist playbook. And uh, all this talk about denazification and liberation and Russian unity and Voldemort baptizing himself. Uh, it's, it's again, straight ahead fascism and fascism is on the move in the world, not just in Ukraine, but in Hungary, in France now, in the US. Um, the Ukrainian people have stood up to his fascism for a long time, but especially since 1991, 2004, and 2013 and 14. And when he invaded on February 24th, they decided to fight, all of them. And thank God they did. Um, Zelensky is right. They're fighting not just for themselves, but for us, for the rest of the world. And we need to support them in that fight. At this point, they say that 80% of Ukrainians believe that they'll prevail in this war and that the war will strengthen them and lead to a formation of a new independent democratic free nation. Listening to Zelensky speak now is like listening to the Czechs in 1938 and 39. The Ukrainian people are risking everything for this. Their physical and moral courage is astonishing. Putin is trying to rewrite the history of the world after World War II to threaten the very idea of Europe. Um, they should make Ukraine a member of the EU now, today, yesterday. The EU is made up of 27 members, including Bulgaria, Hungary, Estonia, Croatia, Slovenia, and Latvia. I say let Ukraine in now. Um, we've been hearing that a lot of, lately we, in the news, we've been hearing that a lot of people who left Ukraine um, are coming back now because they have decided that fighting and dying, maybe dying is better than being a refugee without their loved ones. And I take it that that's what your film is going to be about. Is that right? Yeah, it's it's uh, we it's like John and Yoko. We we like to um, 
talk about love and positive things. Uh, and it's a beautiful moment where Helen and I were on a, a railway station. Um, we'd gotten the train for Lviv to, um, sorry, to Lviv, to Lviv. To Lviv. To Lviv. And, uh, you know, I worry about Helen and uh, I found a train, all the Russians had destroyed the tra train lines. And um, I found a little country train that could get us there. And I looked back at Helen and I said, are you sure you want to do this? Because I realized that it was like jumping out of an airplane in the dark, not knowing whether our parachute had open or whether we'd uh, arrive and be shot. And for the first um, week or so with bombs all around, it was like playing uh, dice with our lives. Um, but there was this beautiful moment where we were standing in the middle of the night, it was freezing cold, and there were about 14 beautiful young uh, Ukraine women on the, on the platform with us. And Helen and I asked them what, what they were doing. And they had a couple of little kids with them. And they said, life's not worth living without the ones we love. Uh, so we're going back. And we were so inspired, we kissed and they, they all clapped. And uh, then it's a 14 hour train ride into Kiev. And when we got in, the men, you know, their families were waiting for them in the tunnel. And it was beautiful. Uh, they all seemed to know how to dance and they held arms and <laughs> danced around. And there was one couple who could really dance like the Bolshoi Ballet, ballet and they kissed. <laughs> and uh, we decided, uh, Picasso used to say, um, I don't seek, I find. And we're lucky in that, we're unlucky in that we have no funding for what we do, but we're lucky in that we can decide what we do ourselves because we haven't got someone back at CNN or the BBC telling us what we have to do. So we decided in that moment we'd make it about uh, love. But since then we've found all sorts of other variations of love. And um, one of them is the animals. You know, there are animal pets, family pets everywhere. And, at, you know, we saw the refugees that were coming to Poland. Um, they weren't allowed to take much luggage, but they nearly all had a basket with a pet in it. And there'd be these beautiful little eyes looking out at you. I know you have a Leon Golub um, drawing of a dog in your collection, David, and, and uh, we're, we love our little fursons. We've got two dogs at home ourselves. And we found this remarkable group of people who um, they're called Star. And uh, the guy that founded it is uh, an, Amer uh, an English soldier from Liverpool, beautiful accent, sounds like John Lennon. And, uh, he was special forces soldier in Helmand province. And uh, he had a terrible nervous breakdown, PTSD, when he got back. And somehow or other he worked with some animals and they fixed him, they repaired him from his PTSD. So he decided to create this foundation and um, devote his life to paying the animals back, to helping them. And uh, so it's very well organised. There's big trucks, there are ambulances, and, but they're for animals, not people. And uh, so we were really the first people into Borodanka. We didn't know how bad it was on the news last night. You know, there are many dead bodies, people tortured and killed by the Russians. But we went directly to the dog shelter. And it reminded me, I actually was, went to, I was the first person into Abu Ghraib when Saddam left the city and it reminded me of going to Abu Ghraib with all the cells and the people who'd been hung and the emaciated remaining prisoners, but these were dogs and uh, the Russians had come in, the dogs had been collected by kind people, I think the people had been killed by the Russians, and then the dogs had been left for 20 days. And those that were inside had died because they had no water, those outside had been able to get uh, rainwater and I thought this is a beautiful story and uh, I was sort of collaborating with Tom he was catching the big uh, ferocious animals to get them into cages and then he picked up the skull uh, you know the jawbone of a dog and he said film this George and I said no I don't want to film that because I realized the dogs had become cannibals and I wanted it to be a good news story <laughs> I didn't want to bring that into it and he suddenly got angry with me and he said no 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 you've got to tell that um you know that's so important it's, it, what's really really sad is that these dogs now have to live what with what they've done and i just suddenly realized that's 
what you're here, you know, you're helping the dogs and you're trying to cope with what you did and, you know, in Helmand. And um, so that he's become part of the film. And that's a story of love and repair as much as, you know, the couples coming together. And we're finding more and more stories like that. So you've seen my films like Miscreants of Tallywood. Um, they're not like normal documentaries. And as an artist, I believe that the documentary form is really controlled mainly by journalists and the people who run the television stations call it factual. And this medium hasn't progressed. So I think it's our job, just like Picasso and Braque, to mess with the medium. We mess with the medium and uh, as much as we can. And uh, so we're making this film parallel with the one that we're doing in Afghanistan. So for the next 18 months or more, we'll be going between Ukraine and, and Afghanistan. And uh, we, we believe sadly that this war will continue on into 2023. And most of the people here believe that um, Putin will have some, possibly have some victories and then he'll be able to justify bringing more military in and he's bent on taking Kyiv. So uh, the defences are not going down here. And the force here is spread very thin but every day, more and more people, very unlikely people, they're older men than me that have got guns and young women, transgender people, um, just about everyone is prepared to lose their life, just like we were prepared to lose our life to come here in solidarity to fight this monster. And um, so Hel Helen, um, you want to speak too, I'm, I'm talking too much. No, no, you're not. I don't think anyone thinks you're talking too much. I'm just going, we've just had an intense uh, three days. We went from Borodanka, um, seeing the, these dogs under like depredated um, circumstances then, and the buildings blown to pieces and, you, and just the lives of, of human beings scattered across the ground in some kind of horrific kind of collage of humanity, broken humanity, where you've got little children's books, you know, their homework books and makeup and boots and boxing gloves, everything you can think of that human beings have in their lives just kind of smashed to smithereens across the ground. And the icon of Taras Shevchenko, this, this country has a poet as their uh, great... Um, character and and of course the Russian soldiers uh, took pot shots at that sculpture and he seemed to be bowing because the, at the bottom of the sculpture like bowing in sorrow it's an extraordinary bizarre um, uh, thing to see and then the day after that we went into uh, butcher which I was just thinking butcher in English has that same kind of phonetic relationship but um and, and ironically so, and just seeing, uh, you know, it was kind of a strange day because it was a, it was kind of like the soldiers were there, the, all the special soldiers doing kind of victory laps of the fact that they had destroyed pretty much in a precision um, target, something like 20 Russian tanks. A whole squadron of a tanks. A whole yeah. squadron of tanks all down one street. Um, it starts with a V, I've, I've forgotten it, but it's just this one street, this beautiful little sort of, uh, you know, European country lane, um, but it's just exploding with these, with the ashes now of uh, dead Russian soldiers. So when we're walking out of that, we're walking out covered in, it's like being at a crematorium, you know, it's, it's, uh, it, it's, um, it's very bleak and it, it's just, it's entering hell and, and who's created this hell? Human beings have, you know, which is, is a strange um, debate that, that you start to have um, in, in, you know, but that's a long debate um, to do with religion. But um, uh, so that was quite horrendous. And then uh, going today to Earpin, um, seeing the opposite, seeing all these a line of civilian cars across the bridge, many of them with little white ribbons tied to them and the, the signage of children uh, on the backs of their cars and, and just these cars, the first front rows just completely blown, burned like 
you know, the fires must have been so hot. You could see chunk, huge chunks of shrapnel embedded into the trees around, around them. And then slowly behind those cars, they were just, some of them were just like hit, you know, uh, covered in bullets. You know, just, you know, it's families, it's civilians. So, you know, and so it's, it's um, it, uh, you know, again, this, the smell of death everywhere and and people just kind of walking stunned everything i think the whole of ukraine has some you know has, has ptsd mm -hmm. but everyone just stunned and trying to breathe and just go and get some groceries is walking this gauntlet of these either the tanks or uh, of the russian soldiers who have been incinerated mm -hmm. or the civilians who have been incinerated massacred most of the bodies had been taken away, but what hadn't been taken away in Bucha was the, the, the bicycle that the guy fell, you know, they shot him and he fell on his bicycle and his, had his jacket and that was on the ground. Or there was a big sort of blood patch and, and two sort of busted um, shopping carrier bags sort of strewn on the ground. Uh, so, you know, um, and then, you know, then George and I are walking down that lane and suddenly a mum comes along pushing her baby in the pram, just trying to get on and live. Mm. And, uh, and it's, um, I mean, it's a philosophical question for someone like yourself, David, <laughs> for us to really question where, you know, humanity and where evil lies. You know, I, I always think of Rana Werner Fassbender and uh, his theatre works post um, World War uh, Two, and the, the sort of bigger German filmmaker. And he said that fascism is comes, in, he had a virtually like a mathematical theorem for, for fascism and it was two against one. So in a play that he um, wrote called Pre-Paradise, Sorry Now, he had just several little vignettes and it's it's about the, it's something innate within us that Fong Bu was talking about within all of us. And that is just in those moments that we give into that weakness where, you know, like it's a, a landlord and his wife picking on the poor young female student or, you know, a doctor and nurse suddenly, you know, making, uh, you know, presumptions about someone who's a heroin addict or, you know, just those sorts of daily behaviors that build and build and build and it's this small mindedness that manifests itself in a, in a psychopath like Putin. Uh, and here we are having to deal with it. He is dragging everyone down into his hell. He's mm -hmm. dragging the transgender full of love people uh, and women and poets, forcing them to take up arms and sucking us all into this vortex. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah. It's, I mean, I, I've been thinking about how the fact that the Ukrainians decided to fight is so important because it, imagine what would have happened if they wouldn't have. Yeah. Well, uh, what, what, what could have happened would have been like um, we've just been in Afghanistan in that Ashraf Ghani, um, you know, he taught at, at John Hopkins. He studied, I think, at Columbia he wrote books on fixing failed states. And I can remember back in Afghanistan, you know, our people all went and voted for him. They were thrilled that they had this wonderful academic intellectual, now it's going to fix their country. And um, then when the Taliban were moving in, America offered to get him out. And as soon as the leader left, um, Afghanistan was gone. And America offered to take Zelensky out. And I think they would have been very happy had he gone. And, and most, they say Americans learn geography from the wars they fight. Americans really don't know where Ukraine is unless they're from Poland or Ukraine itself. And uh, I think they would have been quite, you know, the people in power in America would have been quite happy if this had just, you know, Ukraine had gone back to the Soviet Union. And it's Zelensky's courage, his amazing courage and the courage of everyone here. And now people around the world are rallying. And I love the way uh, when he goes on television, he's just got a T-shirt on. And like he talked to the Australian politicians recently and 
our guys, um, you're a wordsmith, Dave, you know, they have speech writers writing their, their things for us. So our boring prime minister and our boring leader of the opposition in their suits and their ties were reading off uh, written prepared speeches. And Zelensky came in uh, with his T-shirt on, you know, his khaki coloured T-shirt, and he riffed. He uh, took bits out of their speeches and he worked with them, and it looked straight into everyone's eyes. And uh, one of the things that, you know, we, we, you know my work, I had to come here and so does Helen, but we were inspired by the fact that you've got an artist running this country and people think he was just some stand-up comedian, but he made very, very intelligent comedies like um, Peter Sellers kind of things. You know, he was an actor. Uh, His wife is a scriptwriter. Yeah, and um, I think it's so refreshing uh, he didn't ever think that he was going to win the election. He was run, going around the country with his uh, comedy group and suddenly he won 70% of the vote because people were so tired of the corruption and everything else. And, um, you know, it's a world where you've got not just the countries you mentioned, you've got people in Venezuela and the Philippines and uh, Rwanda and all around the world. These dictator strong men are taking power. And uh, the funny thing for me is that in all these war zones uh, that I've gone to, like when you get out at Kabul airport, you'd have um, pictures of the president, you know, either Karzai or Ghani. Of course, in Baghdad, there were the big pictures of Saddam Hussein and um, Nicaragua, it was uh, Daniel Ortega. And here, uh, the giant images of Dwayne, Dwayne Johnson, you know, the rock. <laughs> and so that if the Russians come in, you know, they're looking for something to pull down, like the Americans pulled down the statue of, of Saddam and they vandalised all of his paintings and so on, they'd have to have a go at the rock. And uh, it was quite funny for me. I mean, this is the difference about an artist being in a situation like this and, a, and someone from CNN. I choose to be here. And I was in Baghdad under uh, Saddam Hussein and he was still hanging on to power. And I went down to the Arnold Classic Gym, which uh, uh, the guy, Mr. Saba, who ran it, loved uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger. But so did uh, Saddam. You know, his favourite movie star was Arnold. You know, he constantly had Conan the Barbarian and these movies on uh, Iraqi television. And uh, Mr. Saba was fatalistic. He said, the Americans are going to come in, George. Do you think you could paint uh, Arnold, you know, had some old black and white photos of Arnold on the side of the gym wall. And so I did, and I painted these giant pictures, two giant pictures of Arnold. And I think when the American tanks rolled in, um, you know, they saw Arnold. I think they were very surprised. And uh, Mr. Saba wrote to Arnold and showed him the pictures. And Arnold was so flattered, uh, he sent a container load of new uh, gym equipment <laughs> for Mr. Mr. Uh, Mr. Saba and uh, Mr. Iraq, the bodybuilder of Iraq, came over and said, Hey, George, um, do you think they could get Arnold to be the new president of Iraq? We need someone very strong. So it's quite funny. And then you told me, I didn't know this, that Dwayne Johnson is considering running for president. So, what sort of world are we living in? <laughs> George, have you, I, have, I, don't, I haven't asked you this before, but have you? heard anything about something called the resistance committee uh which is an international detachment made up of anarchists democratic socialists anti-fascists and other leftists uh, from ukraine and from around the world an international group that operate like voluntary militias under the ukrainian military with some degree of autonomy have you heard anything about them while you've been there well, it's interesting. We met um, an Australian one on the train. He figured out how to get the same train, train as us. Um, they're calling themselves a foreign legion. And uh, I'm not all that impressed. You know, they seem to be guys that just want a chance to become heroes and fight, most of them. Mm -hmm. And this guy, I spoke to him, he's covered in tattoos. And um, it's a place where you can use guns and kill people legally, maybe. So, you know, it's not something I'm in favour of. And I think there's more than, more than enough um, highly dedicated 
uh, Ukraines to handle the Soviets. Um, my, my fear is that without a lot of help from America and NATO and everyone else, uh, this could become a very, very prolonged war. And um, we saw what happened in Aleppo. Uh, so I can imagine uh, Putin just does not want to see defeat. And he, you know, he believes he is the state. And uh, around the world in my work, I keep coming close to this terrible group, the Wagner group, uh, you know, particularly in Sudan and Syria and so on. And um, these guys just love to kill. And, you know, out at um, uh, Butcher and places we've been, they're finding bodies where men's ankles are tied and, you know, the men have been tortured and shot in the head for fun and there's bottles of vodka and everything on the table. And you can see these guys are just, Leon Golub get, got it, you know, mm. they're straight out of a Golub painting and they're the worst type of people. And uh, I believe that Putin is so disappointed with his formal army people that he's actually putting uh, Wagner people um, in charge of this war. And that, that's very, very bad for this country. And we look around, you know, we love, you know, the young people here, uh, like there's a beautiful ballet dancer and uh, diva butterfly, and uh, she's trans transgender. And um, she's joined the army and we're walking, you know, down the street the other day and we saw her long hair like mine and she's in a uniform. It's like people, as Helen said, who never considered fighting um, would, and you know, how damaged they will be. Um, back in 1986 in Nicaragua, I made Bullets of the Poets about Daisy Zamora and Gia Condobelli and Dora Maria Teas and all these women poets who are great poets um, Gio Condobelli particularly, she's published in America, and uh, the, the dictator was so bad that they took up arms. Uh, Dora Maria Teas at the time was like the um, number one enemy of America by Ronald Reagan. She was like the Bin Laden at the time. And I just remember this fragile young woman came to see me and that, you know, she's on everyone's hit list because she'd had this master plan of... Um, she and her girlfriends, they wrote poems about it, cut their hair to look like boys, and they fixed up trucks to look like army trucks. And they went and took uh, the Senate building, and they took all the senators, Sir Moses' senators, and his children and, and cousins and things hostage. And for that, they got $3 million, which is a lot of money then. And uh, they uh, got a plane out, and they got Daniel Ortega and the others released from jail. Um, so... My thing with them was that how can poets, people who are so sensitive that they, you know, love life so much that they love to, like you, use words beautifully. Uh, and that's what we're worried about here. The, the whole um, psychology of the country is going to be brutalised. And these days there are not many survivors from the Holocaust. You know, like the people who lived from the Holocaust are now in their 90s and early, you know, 100 and something. And when Helen was talking about seeing a lady um, with her little baby in a pram, we've seen a lot of those. And we've, they're going past dead bodies. You know, Helen's got more taste than me. You know, Helen's not saying what we've actually seen. And it's hard for us to talk about it. But these little children and babies are being exposed to, like, the equivalent of going to the worst concentration camp, just to get outside and be moved along and get some air. Um, one of the horrors for me is that these Russian soldiers have armor, you know, they have body armor and so on. So the body's gone, but in, still inside the armor is the Russian soldier's heart and lungs. And then you find, um, you know, the children are seeing that. And then you see their children, photographs of them and their little things, you know, the, and uh, it's just awful to think that this, wonderful country of poets. It's an art loving country. I'd like to, when this is over, I'd like to make a tourist video encouraging everyone to come to the Ukraine, especially Kyiv, and just to see the art and culture. And uh, everyone's being brutalized by this psychologically. So that's this kind of thing that why artists need to be here. We can talk about this stuff, but the people who are doing the good job for CNN and BBC and all these other things, they're doing 
factual, you know, political stories. We can do the stories about, you know, the effects on children and animals and, you know, transsexual people, transgender people and so on. George and Helen, um, I know that you've been, for the last three days, you've been going out to the, to the front lines, but I wanted to ask you about um, the changes in Kiev and what you've seen in the last 16 days. Have things, I mean, you talked about before the city was mostly empty, uh, there were soldiers and, but uh, has, has that started to change or is that? The yes, it has, David. It's, um, days, yeah. it's only happening in the last couple of days. Every store was closed. So we um, had thought, we, we've got all of our film equipment, we could buy clothes when we got here. We couldn't buy clothes. There were no pharmacies open. Um, and the food was very, very limited. For the first time, Helen and I are both pretty well vegetarians. For the first time today, we were able to get some fresh salad. And after we've done this tonight, we're going to make a beautiful salad. And, and uh, you know, the street light went out, went, came on uh, two nights ago outside of our house. And today it was like, I think, about five or six hours to get to Eprin, Eprin. Um, because so many people who had been hiding in the city uh, decided to go out and see how their grandmother was and people were. So there's a most horrendous traffic jam. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, the city's coming back to life. Uh, you know, there's a few stores that are opening. And uh, on Saturday night, we're going to go and see some friends of Helen's who are Ukraine, who are doing a girl, a girl group, who are doing a, uh, a pop concert to raise money for... Um, very pop, well, <laughs> very whatever. Kiev avant-garde. Yeah, yeah, very, very avant-garde to raise money for the ambulance service. <laughs> and that's going to be interesting. You know, just the idea that, you know, a week ago, the idea of that would be impossible. Um, the curfew has just been extended for another week. So you couldn't have anything like that. Although for a music group, the show has to start at 4 uh, p.m. It's, it's not a late, there's no late night things happening. Um, but yeah, it's good seeing the city come to life and I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of people don't start coming back. Um, where we are, we're right next to the Maidan, which is where, as you know, the Orange Movement were and where the, the protests of 2013-14 uh, for Euro Maidan. And uh, we chose to be here because, and we're going to stay here until there's a victory celebration. Um, the, the artist that was my closest friend back in 1968, 1969 in New York, when I first went there as a young artist, was Joseph Delaney. And his greatest paintings are a V-Day in Times Square. And uh, we think that there's going to be a V-Day mm. sometime in the future Maidan in the Maidan. And we're going to be, we're, we're going to dance for it. We, <laughs> we want to be there to uh, <laughs> celebrate that with the people of, mm. of Ukraine. Mm. And you 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 join that eighty percent of the of Ukrainians that think that they they are going to prevail ultimately. I'm more I'm, I I hope they do, David. I mean, like Assad was a completely evil dictator in Syria, and we know the history of his father was even worse. And a democratic movement of good people rose up against him, and then we saw how the Russians crushed it. Unfortunately, it got mixed up with, with ISIS and fundamentalists, but um, it started out as a pure movement. Um, I'm just praying that uh, something can stop Putin. And um, I think he's capable of anything. I think he's capable of using tactical ne nuclear weapons. Uh, he just doesn't want to lose. And he feels that he has a, a messianic, um, you know, he is Russia. He's the embodiment of Russia. And uh, he's a gangster, you know. So, um, it's, it's uh, it, you know, one funny thing that happened to us, we really needed to escape one night and Helen went searching for a movie and we just switched on um, Munich, which is about Neville Chamberlain mm -hmm. and uh, how um, uh, Chamberlain believed that he could negotiate with Hitler. And there were these two young guys that, trying to get information that Hitler's plan is to take all of Europe. And then, you know, Chamberlain rejects it. They, re he, you know, they risk their lives to get this to him and he rejects it. 
And then, of course, we know that he was wrong. But um, so I think that anyone who thinks that they can negotiate with Putin is very foolish. So I believe that what I do believe, and I hope they prevail, is that everyone in Ukraine that I know of is prepared to sacrifice their life for the freedom of their country. Now, that's a big thing, and that's an American thing. There's nothing more American than these people, you know, the belief that in democracy mm. and love of country. This is a, this is I, a freedom I fight. I, this it's is a freedom fight. I have, in my lifetime, fight. I've never experienced something like this. But, but it's just not, not only everyone volunteering to be soldiers, everyone is doing something. So everyone might have lost their jobs in Kiev, but everyone, you know, uh, you know, our assistant is, you know, ferrying dog food in her boot. And she's quite happy to go drive five hours through traffic to, you know, to feed the dogs. There are people at the train station handing out tea. There's, you know, there's just, everybody is doing something mm. to resist this, um, this looming uh, fascism that, that will take away their lives, yeah. like physically, uh, spiritually, if they win. Mm. And I believe, and so do the Ukrainians believe that if Putin were to get away with this, he wouldn't stop. And he'd, he'd also, instigate like like dominoes the rest of the fascists that are rising up to to start flexing their uh reach as well well belarus has got an even worse monster than putin and and uh xin jinping in china is you know in the they're same... very worried about taiwan yeah you know, uh, they're, 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 they're just maybe they're just sitting back watching and to see how this goes mm -hmm. to see how um the the europe uh, Australia, England, America response. We, we can't forget what China recently did to the freedom movement, all those lovely young su students in Hong, in Hong Kong. But for me, as someone who, I think the reason why I'm 72 years old and I keep doing this is because I have the tools to talk about this because I've been in Afghanistan as the Russians left. I've known the Taliban. And I've seen all this history. I've been in Baghdad when America bombed it, um, you know, under Saddam Hussein. And um, there are so many patterns that I'm seeing repeated here in that um, it really was the Russian invasion of Afghanistan uh, that brought down the Soviet Union. But also what we're living in, my father and uncle and all the men I know, I was born just after World War II, they went and fought the fascists. And then they fought the Japanese. And these were, my father was a singer, my uncle was a poet. And that's why, what I worry, it changed them. My, my uncle actually uh, finally took his gun from the war and shot himself. He couldn't live anymore with the memory of, of the war. And I love that man. He was a great poet. And uh, so, you know, it's, it's just very, very disturbing to know that uh, this is, is happening in this world, that we're, this is a conventional war. So in, in Afghanistan, you had these very brave people of Mahujuddin, you know, America corrupted it by employing the bin Laden and the Saudis to fight. But the actual Afghan fighters were just farmers and they defeated the Russians with AK-47s and, you know, rocket propelled grenades. And just coming into Afghanistan was very like this. Uh, after the Russians left, the Afghans had destroyed so many tanks that where they destroyed a bridge, they could pile the tanks on top of each other, hundreds of them, and uh, build a bridge that way. And you realise that, uh, that a, a brave soldier with a rocket launcher, it's much better to be that guy hiding behind a rock and firing at a tank. So this idea that Russia has all these tanks and they can crush countries, it doesn't work if the people are as brave as the Afghans were. And now, of course, the Afghans are saying, well, we've, defied, we've defeated both the superpowers. We defeated Russia and then we defeated America. And you've seen my film, our film Love City, where the American drones were going out every day and bombing innocent Afghans. And you get people like Tom, who's here from Afghanistan, saving the dogs. Mm. And he killed Afghans that he now can't, can't you know, forgive himself for. Mm. So there's that. But then the horror for me is a large part of my life. I campaign for the international campaign to land, to, you know, ban landmines, which America has not joined and Russia has not joined. 
So the most despicable thing that the Russians have done, they've now covered this country in land and anti-personnel mines. Mm. So when we were down at uh, Irpin today, mm. uh, there were mines going off everywhere, possibly children being blown up by them. And, um, you know... That really just... struck, that struck me, George, that this, the, I know your background in, with landmines, and now it's come all the way back around so and as it's I, I wrote to you you know there's a new kind of landmine out there that the russians are using that uh, is seismic sensitive and picks up footfalls and will blow somebody up with fragments uh, up to 50 yards so those ones that you're describing were going off around us today yeah. uh, and uh, in order to film uh, i have to um go off the track. And fortunately, because I've worked with army engineers of every nationality all over the world in Burma, Cambodia, Angola, Mozambique, all of these places, I know where to tread and how to deal with them. But also they're booby trapping things. And yeah. one of the most difficult moments of my life was in Baghdad where I'd had friends and they're father had gone out and been shot by the Americans and he's on the road but the American army wouldn't let anyone collect the bodies uh, because they said they'd been booby trapped and so he had the family I know is looking out their window and there's their father getting bigger and bloating and the dogs are coming out and eating him in front of him and uh, that's what's been happening here too and um Oh, it's just horrendous. So they've been booby-trapping booby the bodies. Yesterday, Helen found a, um, a fake baby. Mm. A, a thing, the thing that was made to look like a baby mm. in swaddling yeah. cloth. Yeah. And as a woman, she felt like picking it up. I, I almost was, did. I almost I, I had to and stop then I just her pulled myself and it was back. a booby trap. Mm. Helen would have been blown mm. to pieces. Mm. So how sinister and perverse is that? Mm. You know? um, I, I worry, uh, actually, because... With all the years that I covered landmines and um, and booby traps and things, I remember at Abu Ghraib, um, I came to a very sad place where um, Saddam had perversely and for no reason at all, all these political prisoners that he had there, people like yourself, university pre professors and lecturers that he, you know, felt they were a threat to him. Um, their relatives came and they're waiting outside the gallows and they're hoping that he had not hung their relatives. You've probably seen my footage of that. And uh, they're waiting for me because they knew, I, they knew that I could um, disconnect the booby traps and the mines. And so he booby trapped the gallows. So I had to go in and uh, like an expert, disconnect the booby traps. And if anyone had followed me in there, they would have been blown apart. And then it was incredibly sad. They came and saw the, the notices. And these are some of the, you know, the intellectual greats of that country. And Saddam, he knew he'd lost, but he still had them killed at the last minute. And um, one of the sad things was, and this is where you and I connect, actually, because you've written so brilliantly about Abu Ghraib. Um, the relatives were there trying to find their loved ones. I knew where their loved ones were, but I knew dogs had eaten them and I didn't want them to see that. And they, one of them came, he's a brilliant young man, and he came up to me with a noose. And the nooses that had been used, everyone had their own noose and the name was written on it in Arabic. And a, a thing that the executioner does, he's not Saddam Hussein, he's the man who has to do a job, is to wrap uh, tissue paper around the noose so that when it goes over the neck it doesn't you know the roughness is not felt by the person who's about to die but when the noose comes tight bits of skin and perspiration and so on in, end in the tissue and these relatives uh, came up to me they're so used to having to take orders from someone and they didn't need me to say so but they said George do you think that we can have the nooses it's all that we have left of our relatives and I said, of course, take them. And then they were walking away and then they thought they'd come back and they said to me, they thought that I was someone who could talk to the Americans. They said, George, if the Americans come here and they destroy this place, they level it with 
bulldozers. We will all support them. Now, these are the families of thinking people of Baghdad. And you know what happened. You know, you know what, what happened. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. So, uh, Carolyn, we're, I, uh, we're at about an hour now. Shall we take a couple of questions? Do you? Sure. Yeah, we have a few. Um, did you feel like showing a couple images or should we move on to questions? Is that uh, yes, I can do that too. I mean, I put together this whole thing, but it seems kind of superfluous now. <laughs> but uh, well, it. I'll, been I'll just run through it. And yeah. George and Helen can talk about the, can you see it now? Um, not yet. So if you click the green share screen button at the bottom, and then when, and then click the PowerPoint screen. Perfect. Yeah. yeah. And if you want to, um, you can hit play slideshow and we can just run through them briefly if you want or start. Well, this is, that's, that's our press pass, which we've got from the Ukraine government. And we have to show that at every roadblock, which can be every couple of hundred meters. And particularly when we're out in the car and there's Helen. Mm, terrible photo. <laughs> <laughs> wait, 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 David, click, click play from start up there or play from current slide. You see that? Yeah. I'll tell you what they are like tightly. And, and then you can tap. Look at that one, David. <laughs> David, David. <I'm> sorry. <laughs> And this this is as fresh. That's this is today. today. These are the cars of the first arrived at the bridge, and the Russians uh, killed the people in them. And um, yeah, when I when I, as soon as I got back tonight, I had to uh, get in the bath. You know, the smell of human death was too strong. You were calling this the bridge of death. This is this is people who were trying to escape. Yes, that's right. Um, what happened was the. Uh, Ukraine army had to blow this bridge up because it's very, very close to Kyiv. And had Russian tanks gone through there, Kyiv would have fallen. And so it's also where the most intense fighting has continued virtually until yesterday. And we we're among the first people there. And um, these people thought the bridge was still operational. And so hundreds of cars came trying to get into Kyiv where they felt safer. The Russians were all around. And the Russians just went in and slaughtered them in their cars. And the cars are the saddest thing you've ever seen. You know, there are things like laptops in there which people haven't touched, which is interesting. Uh, there's been, you know, it's almost like, would you take the laptop of a, of a or a camera of a, um, of a dead person? But also baby photographs and many, many toys. So we don't call it the bridge of death. The locals have, have called it the bridge of death. And that, that continued. Um, the Russians would say, and we're going to have a, a, a corridor and people would come down and they made a little like wooden walk bridge down below it. And um, uh, then they renege on that and they killed the people who were trying to get across on foot. And uh, Kate, our um, the young Chef filmmaker who's, who's working with us, like the young people who are working with us um, are the kind of people who go to the SVA, you know, they're people who want to become filmmakers and artists. And uh, so we're giving them employment and training at the same time. And uh, her mother and grandfather, grandmother were caught in that. And mm. so she had anxious hours. And fortunately, they were able to get through mm. uh, in a moment of calm when the Russians weren't killing people. So this has affected everyone. Oh, yeah. That, that's Borodanka. Yeah, that's Borodanka. Yeah. Yeah, uh, it's, it, it's just unbelievable. There's about 10 high rises it's a very high rise kind of uh building that's that's yesterday in bucha that's the local guy who's an architect and his father lives on that street and uh, his father died during the bombing he had a heart condition and just the endless explosions and bombings and this is a funny moment um uh, at, at Bucha yesterday, yesterday, yeah. and um, where we met um, another artist. See, I turned around suddenly and I saw another artist singing with, um, uh, at, and I just thought, my God, and his name was George. <laughs> and it was really strange, uh, but he, you know, he was a kind of technical newspaper person. So it was really, mm. his drawing was like he was trying to draw a photograph. And then George just sat down and did this, 
incredible expressionist kind of piece next to him and and I thought for a moment how different George is from journalists how he's more like Tom the the ex-soldier who who's trying to get over the atrocities and trying to go back and kind of almost mend things put things back together uh, by 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 setting up this uh company or uh that foundation that look that saves animals in mm. in war zones. So. These are just these are uh, some from previous films. I mean, I didn't I didn't talk that much about the films, but there are these. Well, this is our films. yellow house. This is our yellow house in Afghanistan, and in the middle is the Supi, uh, who was wonderful. He taught. Um, music, harmonium and, and so on. And ISIS killed him, you know, that when, when he went to perform in a park, mm -hmm. they came and uh, cut out his tongue and smashed his harmonium and uh, we're still suffering. But all of these people, Helen, there's Niha, who's the principal teacher at the Yellow House and Helen. And uh, we believe in art in place of war. And so what happened, I was working in Pakistan and um, all the people, uh, the artists and creative community in, in Jalalabad said, we need you, George, more than Pakistan does. And we went there and I said, so what do you need most? And they said, we have no art schools, no film schools, nothing. And no place where women could come and talk to a publisher about publishing their books or anything because male and female society is broken. So we create, created the um, Secret Garden Cafe where uh, a young lady, poet or writer, we could organised for her to meet a publisher, otherwise she'd never see a book published. And all of that happens. Anyway, the Yellow House is still running and uh, that drains Helen and I of all of our resources. And this is the Yellow House in Chicago where uh, some of the people, we made um, White Light and we've made a new film. No Bad Guys. No Bad Guys. And um, yeah, all the people from there are still following us. And this is... People? A, a, a amazing group uh, in the firehouse. Tamari T and the Electro Company. And the Electro Company. And the place is, it's in Chicago, and it's the greatest sense of hope. It's called the Music Box, Found, Box Foundation. Mm. And people are saying, how can we solve this terrible gun problem? And they're all saying, we will replace the guns with musical instruments. And Helen, you know, you know the history of music in Chicago and how important this is. Oh. That's a that's an hour conversation. It's incredible music. You know what was the most amazing thing was was that when we arrived in Southside Chicago, I knew about the history of the blues and and everything. I'll go Chicago. back though, David. Just let, back to that other Maybe one. Maybe we're let, running let, out of time. Let, but let, anyway, help. what I realized no, not about that one, the next Chicago one. is is that that one. Um, that's not Chicago. Anyway, no. what I realized about Chicago is that people like Mahalia Jackson, Nat King Cole, Muddy Waters, uh, Howlin' Wolf, uh, Cab Calloway, they all lived in the segregated side of Southside Chicago, which is still there, which is still intact. So that's another long story. So we, we believe with the Pe Music Box Foundation, so we've created a kind of a Chicago yellow house with them. We, we're dedicated to going back to Chicago continuously. Mm -hmm. We may even buy a place there and make the yellow house mm -hmm. permanent, like the one in Afghanistan. In Bronzeville. So the yellow house Amazing are becoming place. like McDonald's. They're becoming a <laughs> franchise. And this is our newest yellow house in Peshawar because um, these are all the artists that we help get out of Jalalabad when the Taliban took over after America left. Yeah. And we, we're calling it the yellow submarine um, to Tallywood. And uh, it's a sanctuary that we've created. And that's, that's the mural behind it. And uh, yeah, and that's, that's back when um, that's uh, the Occupy Wall Street thing mm -hmm. where I'm doing it's portraits Park, of Zakati Park. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's a thing that, uh, yeah. And there you are, you can explain that one, Dave. Mm -hmm. uh, this is the Shangam School. Peter Lamborn Wilson and me, Kara Lee and Mick Tausig when, uh, when George came to visit. Mm -hmm. yeah. And there's Kara Lee. Beautiful Kara Lee. Kara Lee I, I, I miss her. And, and this I, is Leon Gallup. And he was a great mate. I certainly miss Leon. You know, we, he had such a and wonderful Nancy. sense of humor. And Nancy. 
Um, I did collaborative work, <laughs> with both of them, and that's one of my photos. Yeah. That's his finger up. <laughs> that's the person. It, it's interesting what uh, uh, Leon taught me something about myself, which um, when, as you know, when he was he had cancer, he said, "George, um, I figured out your secret." And uh, I said, "What do you mean, Leon?" And he said, "Well, I'm dying now, and and I'm not." painting or drawing for anyone but myself you know and um he said so I, I can imagine when you're leaving your studio to go to you know Baghdad or Rwanda or whatever um you know you don't pay for anyone but you know that could be like your last painting or one of your last works and he's right you know that's what I don't have a lot of time to paint but when when I do it's usually before I'm coming somewhere like this and I just have to make those work special because I never know whether there'll be another one. And there we are. That's uh, that's talking to the Taliban in Afghanistan. There, uh, this is my friend um, Milana Zukani, who is Zukani, who is the Zucani. leader. Zukani, you're saying Zukani? It's Zukani. I'm going to say Hukani. Hukani. <laughs> I'm bad on pronunciation. It's Milana, Milana Hukani. And he was a wonderful man, highly educated. People think that the Taliban are dumb mullahs. He's got many degrees from many universities. And he, he sponsored the Yellow House. And um, uh, sadly, uh, he was killed by ISIS. And uh, now, but the good thing is that his brother uh, is now running, is now the mayor of uh, Jalalabad. So just as he gave protection to our Yellow House then, um, and the day that he first came, uh, we'd been imagining the Taliban would come and cut our heads off. And it was a relief when he came and said, no, we love you. What you're doing is good for the people of Afghanistan. And they put an umbrella of protection over us. Uh, yeah. And that's on the roof of, you know, the Yellow House in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. There's a Cody Park again. And mm -hmm. that's, mm -hmm. that's one of my works about um, what happened recently in your Capitol building. This is Rwanda. We haven't talked about Rwanda today, but the toughest experience of my life was being at the Kabeo massacre. And this is the drawing I did for a painting before I left for here. And there's um, a painting um, about Chicago. And there's Soundtrack to War, the film you started the talk with, David. Yeah, I just watched it last night to see, I hadn't seen it for a long time and to see if it holds up and it does hold up. It's an I'm amazing glad. film. I encourage anyone to go see it. You uh, know, um, find it. someone sold it to Amazon, who are not us, mm -hmm. and uh, Amazon have had sold millions of views of it mm -hmm. and uh, won't tell us who it was they've sent the money to. And they've got a like a um, an app that, so when our lawyer writes to them, they get a, in, an automated, a automated message. And our, our lawyer said, George, forget about it. Uh, you can't fight artificial intelligence. So that's a future. <laughs> is Dante in play. sandbags. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That's it. And this um, is Dante. Park. This is here. Yeah. And there's little, um, you know, Shazier and Steel. And Steel. And they're, they're once again, they're mature and they're back in the other stars of our film, mm -hmm. Snow Monkey. And there's not time, but this is an incredible love story between these two kids. <laughs> Kids. And they're still together. Beautiful. And there's yeah. Uh, yes, yeah. they are. And uh, he's kind of gone legit. He's that actually, uh, that's me as a child, running a, um, still always a rebel. And there's the. That's the statue I was talking used, about earlier. Yeah. Chichenko. Yeah. Used as a target. And there are statues of Chichenko all over the country. And there's also a, a Shevchenko street Shevchenko place behind the cooper union oh, uh, really? off of seventh really? street and wow. they have put this shrine for uh ukraine in the there's a ukrainian church there orthodox church amazing yeah there's tara Shevchenko place no it, i know there are a lot of uh ukrainians living in new york you know like well there's is there a little odessa they call it a beautiful yeah. thing yeah. A beautiful things happen. If you see our film White Light, um, Kaylin was killed on Maybrook in Chicago, Pryor. Kaylin Pryor, mm. and they've just renamed the street Kaylin Way. Mm. So it doesn't just happen for fa famous poets, it happens mm. for people in Southside Chicago mm. as well. It's beautiful. We love Alan beautiful. Pryor, her, her, her dad, who's 
never lost faith in um, Stop Putin. <laughs> in trying to win guns in Chicago. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So, uh, Carolyn, what what now? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Thanks for the slides. Oh, perfect. You got us out of there. Um, so yeah, thank you all. I'm like spinning with this conversation. It's been incredible. Um, I'm uh, going to read our first question um, on behalf of Anna, whose sound is a little funny. Um, so Anna wanted to know, are the restrictions being imposed by America and other countries really making a difference? Also, I've not seen a war that isn't a moneymaker for some. Who do you think is capitalizing from this war and how can they be stopped? That's a great question. And the worst thing is that the Saudis are the ones that are making money out of it because of the price of oil going up. Aye, and, it, aye. and it frightens me also that America is now making concessions to Venezuela. And uh, so the, the, the you know other bad guys are being helped because they're not as bad of bad guys as Putin. And uh, as you know, I worked on Fahrenheit 9-11 with Michael Moore. And uh, the, the Afghans had nothing to do with 9-11 and the Iraqis had nothing to do with 9-11. In fact, Saddam Hussein sent a, sent a message to, um, to George Bush saying, be careful, the, the Wahhabis, the Saudis are planning something. And as you know, most of the pilots and the crews that did 9-11 were Saudi. And, um, you know, George Bush did not go into Afghanistan to uh, liberate the women. And, uh, it, you know, if anything, America needed to do something with Saudi Arabia. And what they're doing, I love Yemen. I've worked in Yemen. It's one of my favorite countries in the world. And um, the UK and Europe are supplying the Saudis with the weapons which are destroying uh, Yemen. So yes, um, the wrong people are making a lot of money out of this war and other bad people are being elevated um, because of oil. And sanctions, are sanctions really doing anything? I think so. I think the, the, the advantage of the sanctions is that, particularly ones like McDonald's and, um, you know, the French pulling out of making uh, Renault cars and Starbucks and so on, because, and the sporting ones are incredibly important yeah. because, uh, the, the common people in uh, the average people in Russia follow uh, football, soccer and so on. And now they're no longer allowed to play. So all, I think the sanctions, uh, Putin has gone into a new phase of his life where he just wants to be, um, uh, you know, it's his legacy is to reunite the Soviet Union. So he doesn't care about money anymore. Most of his money is out of the country anyway. But these sanctions that send messages like the drop in the value of the, of the ruble, uh, reaching the people and what everyone here, everyone here is hoping that there will be a revolution in, in Russia. Yeah. And uh, everyone here is saying there are two wars, George. There's a war that we're fighting against Putin's forces, but there's also the war which brave people are fighting in yeah. Russia. Yeah. And that's where I think, I believe the sanctions are more important yeah. uh, for that because it reaches the public than hitting... Um, you know, the oligarchs and, and mm. um, Putin's own pocket. However, I'm, I'd just like to add um, uh, Zelensky's defense minister in a recent speech said, I need three things, weapons, weapons, and weapons. And I That's think correct. I think in order to save Donbass from falling, uh, unfortunately, uh, there has to be, uh, you know, real defence there, and that that's really important. And they particularly need drones. Um, a lot of the soldiers we meet are IT experts, and they're not, but they can operate a drone. So mm -hmm. Elon Musk has repositioned satellites, and we've seen them taking out Russian tanks with drones mm -hmm. that are not much bigger than this, operated mm -hmm. by guys that were probably kids playing they video are, games. They are kids. And, um, that kind of new high technology is what's needed. And I learned a long time ago when I was in the Western Sahara and people, you know, find it remarkable. They saw that giant uh, row of, you know, all this armor, heavy armor, Russian armor coming in. People thought, how can you beat that? But the truth is a tank is vulnerable from the side. And, you know, the kind of World War II battles that they were suited to, they're not suited to this. So in Western Sahara, uh, the wonderful Sahara, we were fighting the Moroccans who had, Mirage fighter planes, and I'd be behind a rock with a, uh, a Sahrawi Arab, and he'd have a, 
a missile, and there'd be a huge blue sky and there's a Mirage fighter and he'd take it out. And I'd rather have been behind the rock with him than being the co-pilot in the plane. So that's the kind of weapons that they need, the kind of weapons where they know the terrain and they can take on Russian armor and, and equipment. Russians can't fly helicopters here because people have got so many anti-aircraft uh, things. And just the soldiers on our corner a few nights ago, uh, we thought oh, yeah. the Russians had come in because they're all firing the AK-47s. Mm. Uh, they're shooting down drones. Mm. And uh, they've got little laser lights that they can, I think, have come from America, maybe from Musk, and they can illuminate the drone with that, and then sharpshooters can shoot it. So, yes, uh, they need, and also the most important thing is I think America, Australia, and all these other countries need to send non combatant non-combatant mine clearers, engin army engineers. Ah, nobody's talking about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The At the moment, that's the most important thing. Australia's just been giving them Bushmaster. uh, Bushmasters, which are vehicles designed for mine clearance. So they've got a V-shaped hull and they've got metal wheels so they can drive through a minefield and the mines explode and they don't hurt the vehicle. But that creates a safe path for the mine clearers and will go in with their dogs and things and gradually Otherwise, there's no safe avenue to mm. clear the mine. So I think at the moment, the world needs to start talking about that. What Ukraine needs most is non-combatant mine clearance mm. and those kinds of weapons which uh, can be operated without, you know, being tanks and aeroplanes and so on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I, I did want to say one little thing there, and I think what the Ukraine needs and what the whole world needs, and that is... is this is so much a battle, a war of truth and lies. And drones are now being used in order to try and, you know, stop the, the, the con this confusion saying, you know, the, the Russians are saying, oh, uh, Ukrainians are staging deaths. And so these young guys now are using drones to, with footage of showing the Russian soldiers shooting uh, yeah. civilians outright. But I also think that, uh, creative minds you know war is over that's what mm. we believe war is over it doesn't work it's never worked it's primitive and we should we are more highly evolved than that now we pray mm. and hope and we can use our creative minds our brilliant minds to and that's why sanctions are, are quite interesting just to to try and maneuver this chess game uh with this terrifying uh looming monster over us i had a creepy experience talking about high tech twice now helen and i when we're up in dante park for some reason i've been talking to helen and suddenly a, a laser dot's dancing all over her face so someone has been practicing with the sniper's rifle on helen's head and um yeah you know, i know i know they're thing. young ukrainian soldiers because i'm sitting here she's still alive but now. this is the kind of high tech war that it is mm. But when you know the city, like the city is three times bigger than Sydney that I come from, and I was in Bosnia, and the reason why uh, the Serbs weren't able to take Sarajevo was there were lots of very high concrete buildings, and no army can come in without terrible losses because you can have snipers in these high windows. They're almost invulnerable. They're like the best modern fortress. So uh, the, the cost to Russia would have been enormous if they'd actually tried to come into the city in terms of lives. It's this actually, it's, it's larger, Kiev is larger in area than New York City. New yes, York City is like 330, 305 square, square miles and, and uh, Kiev is more than that, 35. One of, the problem, one of the problems is that all the uh, world news media are all up in the high and inter intercontinental hotels, which look over old Kiev, so you see these churches of the gold domes and you think it's quite a small place mm. but if you walk up to what we now call dante park because mm. of the sculpture of dante yeah. you look out and there's this skyline which looks like four new yorks it's just one it's skyscraper huge. after another it's huge mm. and um yes it's it would be a massive city to take so people have been thinking it's actually a small island-like city that the russians would come into but it's it's enormous it's enormous mm. George, I have to say that when I when I heard you talk to the Australian broadcasting uh, company about why you chose the building in Kiev that you're staying in, you talked about being on the sixth floor, not the top floor that could be hit by bombs and not too far down so the 
it collapse won't, wouldn't collapse on you. Other buildings and streets around make it hard for rockets to get in. Thick walls, you wanted to make sure it had thick walls that might withstand a bomb blast and, and a sturdy bathroom to go into. That's and true. I thought that's, that's, that's the George I know. That's, that's, that's well, comes from I've, experience. I've done this in so many places, but the other important thing is that never to stay in a, um, a media hotel. One, because they're targets, but also because the atm atmosphere is corrosive, that you've got all these journalists there. And uh, uh, on principle, we don't um, wear, wear armour. We don't, we're, and we've been making a point of it. And the, the rule here uh, for the media is that you're not allowed to go anywhere or do anything like we've been doing unless you have a helmet and armour. Mm. But we won't do that because... The mothers with their prams and the people that we relate to uh, would just see us as some press like vulture kind of like person, you know, with all this armor on, like a robot, and they wouldn't want to talk to us. So we've resisted that and it's working. We're finding that no one's, once we get there, we're told we can't go there without armor, but when, once we get there, we find that, you know, there's, there's, everyone's happy for us not to have armor. Yeah. And yeah. we I'm an old man. I, I pass for one of the locals and you know, we, we, we blend in and we sit down with people and they're surprised when they hear our Australian accents. And then they're terribly happy to know that we've come all this way to be with them. Yeah. We're glad that you've come all that way too. Carolyn, what's what's next? Um, yeah, uh, so, well, we were, we were wondering, um, Helen, when you brought up the concert kind of about um, creative resistance. Um, and so we wanted to actually turn it to Charlie um, to ask a question about that. Mm -hmm. Let's see, make sure you can unmute here. <laughs> there we go. Thank you, Carol. <clears throat> Thank you, Carolyn. Thanks, uh, mm -hmm. David and uh, George and Helen. It's been a very uh, stimulating and informative conversation. Um, I was just thinking simply, what is there graffiti in Kiev? What's it like if, if there is? Um, do you know who makes it? Yeah, it's really yeah. just really that. That's interesting. Yeah, that's um, right. when, you, when you walk around Krakow in Poland, the gra graffiti is horrible. It's just signing, you know, like, so you'll have, a, you'll have tagging. You'll have a, uh, a, a beautiful wall that's all, uh, you know, hundreds of years old and textured. And they'll have done a, like a, a sprayed silver over it and ruined it. Uh, there's not that kind of graffiti here. It's it, it's museum quality graffiti everywhere, and there are many many art spaces. And a lot of it is um, I'm I'm actually documenting it. Uh, there's uh, and there's some incredibly powerful graffiti about stopping the war and so on. So uh, that's a great. I should send you some of my photographs. And even uh, when it's tagging, they tend to keep it just in one place. And it's many different taggers just doing things only about this size, and it becomes like a beautiful Jackson Pollock painting. So I love that question. Okay, I, 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 yeah. I will, I'll answer something on that too. Uh, Kiev is renowned and takes pride in their giant murals. So there's one, the wonderful thing was when we arrived at our little apartment here, the reception um, had a, a, a book open on the desk with a, a mural on it called The Protectress. And she's in Shevchenko Lane where we are, and she's giant, you know, it's, we're looking at a, what, a 20, 30 story high building. Yeah. And so, and the, 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 there was actually a, uh, an app where you can find where all these incredible murals are. Um, Kiev is a place that has been uh, fighting for their freedom for a long time since the days of Shevchenko, and there's a female poet as well. And um, she, uh, they they've ha have a long history of they're sacrificing their lives for freedom. And, uh, and they're incredibly creative people mm. here. So there's a theatre every block. There's a, uh, you know, interesting, art galleries everywhere yeah. it's it's a it's an explosion of art and artists here in this town in, in my whole life i've never been in a city which has got more emphasis on the arts you know yeah. shrines of poets and uh, than here it's amazing and, and i'm embarrassed that i did not know about it 
Uh, mm. There's more of a concentrated sense of, of art being loved and appreciated. And that's why there's no, mm. almost no bad quality graffiti. The gra you know, I think people, the high quality of the graffiti uh, makes everyone have high standards. And you'll never find it on some ancient um, facade or some, you know, world heritage kind of building, whereas in Krakow and places like that, you do. It's interesting. Thank you so much. Thank you. You should come and do some, uh, meet the artists here. I think you'd yeah, love them. It's amazing. Um, well, speaking of um, artists and poets, um, there have been so many wonderful questions. Maybe we can take like one more after, but um, I would, we have a tradition of ending our conversations with um, a poetry reading. Um, and I'm just so thrilled uh, today we have Jenya Turovskaya here with us. Um, so I'd just like to introduce her. Um, Jenya was born in Kyiv and grew up in New York City. She's the author of numerous chapbooks, translations, and several publications, um, including The Breathing Body of This Thought, a book from Black Square Editions. She's received a Fund for Poetry grant, a McDowell, McDowell Colony Fellowship, and a Whiting Award, um, among many other awards. Um, so I'd love to turn it over to you, Jenya. Hello. Um, can you hear me fine? Can you see me fine? Um, first of all, thank you for having me. It's been uh, such an extraordinary experience um, listening to your conversation. Um, thank you, David and George and Helen. And thank you, George and Helen, for witnessing the unbearable and bringing it back to us. Um, you know, I'm a Soviet born Jewish, Russophone, Ukrainian. And um, it has been such an experience of helplessness and horror to watch the devastation that is happening in my, in my homeland. Um, it's brought up so much of the kind of emotional inheritance that I um, have explored in my work as a poet and um, in my other job, which is I'm, I'm a psychotherapist and a trauma therapist. Mm. Yeah. So, you know, this, for me, so much of what this experience has brought up is this, is the legacy, you know, my, my parents' legacy. My, my father is a Ukrainian artist. Both my parents were born before World War II began and were refugees and displaced by the fascist invasion. Um, of Ukraine that happened then. Um, and, you know, the history repeats itself. Um, I'm also someone who, it, it takes me a long time to process <laughs> through writing what I experience and there's something about what's happening now, there's been much more of an immediacy in, in my own work. Um, so, the first, I'm going to read two from two pieces. Um, the first is a response to a photograph of Volodymyr Zelensky contemplating Bucha and the devastation of Bucha. God of lightning, God of thunder. Don't look. Don't look away. Come to what's left of home. The brightness of the cold spring sun doesn't warm the red buds beating along the bare upraised arms of the red maple freezes the grimace on the face of the servant turned god of lightning, god of thunder, tired, eyed, broken hearted, god who contemplates the rust red wreckage, presides over first brights, last 
writes, the whispered vows of the wedding inside the bunker. And the next pieces that I'm going to read are from a longer manuscript that I'm currently working on called Atomic Noun, which at its center is a long sequence called Enter Ghost. Um, which is about emotional inheritance and transgenerational transmissions and the, the past becoming the present. So from Enter Ghost. Enter Ghost into your contractual obligations, your obligatory forms. Enter the condition of the afterlife. Be coalesced equivocally to enter into the grace of pure bewilderment, sentence, sentience, all those necessary or unnecessary angels, the brute or better angels of our nature, the domesticated angels defanged declawed, denatured, heavy and flightless birds. Enter revisers of maps, the vanquishers and vanishers of nations, the last of the natives, tenacious linguists of the dead and dying languages. Enter the scribes, the typists, the data interests, their lists of feast days and fast days. Enter the place names of displaced persons, the ship manifests, the inconstant consonants and vowels lost in transliteration. Enter the retouchers, the touch and touch and touch deep into the private life of identifying markers, touching out the eyes with gouges of rectangular black. Enter revisionists, the preoccupied and unreliable narrators of their own dreams. Enter the red hoods of the grand inquisitors, the little reds, the riders. Enter the winders of clocks, the professional rewinders and the amateur pornographers, ravelers of spools of magnetized tape. Enter the creamy lingering musk of ghosting lovers, the nostalgic apologists, atrocity deniers, the long winded bores. Enter the wind or the wind whistling loose, the clinging leaves and a copse of trees into which enter stampeding bores wild, brilliant-eyed, rooting with their tusked snouts in the black loam of a thought, enter a thought, scraping its cuneiform against the scrub of time. Enter ghost into the anthem's chorus, your vacant and aching counterpoint. The vowels of its voiceless known, what is known but not thought, felt but not formed to thought. Enter as agitated air, as flustered moths, as a sound shaped in the aperture of a gaping mouth. Enter apparitions of imperiled empire, no air apparent, apportioned and partitioned, breathless and late, as the present enters and re-enters and re-enters the present tense. These next two I wrote as the war started. Enter the bourbon and 
mint-laced breath of murmuring seducers. The tender savagery of their profiles, the ready graze and poetry of their stealthy tapered fingers. Enter self-proclaimed saviors, diamond encrusted messianic antichrists, their sticky, ill-gotten, ill-begotten gains. Enter the transpersonal gaze of their benevolent eyes, brackish and softly distant, the color of cold, wet sand. Enter ruthless Aravists, masochistic agonists, bliss seekers, the ever-diminishing returns of their ecstasies. Enter the carnivores and the plant-based meat eaters with the rust of blood on their hands. Enter the lambs, the innocents, the sullen, gangly, achingly beautiful adolescents, pulsing the blinding searchlight of their precarious innocence. Enter the soft downed ducklings pecking out of their translucent shells under the artificial suns of heat lamps and the hatcheries imprinting forever to their duck hunters. And I'll end with this. Enter mother, enter mother's mother and her mother's mother's mother. Enter unnamed mother called only mother, enter ferocious mother of all sons, trillion eyed, trillion armed mother of all saviors, mother of all bombs, all bombs, all salvos, all salves. Enter mother of all slaves, all masters, enter mother of all psalms, all amens, all women, men, all elegies, all howls, all keening wails. Enter mother of all mother tongues, enter the old mother that forgets her daughter's name. Enter mother that climbs down from the swaying trees and gently picks the fleas out of our matted fur. Thank you. Thank you so, so much, Jenya. That was a really beautiful way. Beautiful. Can I say something a little bit about that in that um, I think that's the perfect poem because at the moment, this is a hit. The last a whole, no, well, all of the poetry, but particularly this emphasis on, well, Helen agree, you know, the, the monsters, the killers, but for me, it's been the ghosts. And that's why um, when we're filming, I've never felt it so much before or been able to capture it. Uh, there's the curtains blowing in people's windows mm. and the families have been killed and it's gone. There's the little tags and things inside cars. Everything's sort of moving with the breeze and the wind and you can feel mm. the spirits. And that's why for me, it's important sometimes to sit down and just draw because when you're moving along with the cameras, you're moving through, you're like, mm. it's a journey. But when you stop and draw, the mm. spirits start to talk to you and you see uh, anthropomorphic faces that become, you know, it might be a stain of something on a wall and it becomes a man's face who may have died in that car. And you start becoming aware of the spirits and the ghosts. And, you know, my book is Blood Mystic and um, I am a mystic. And I think it's a world where mystics are, treated as madmen and uh, as well as being an artist I think it's good to bring the mystic here and I believe that uh, just to create in the face of this destruction and that's why it's so important that so many artists have stayed in Kiev when uh, the military machines coming in and destroying someone may be creating a poem in a room like you or uh, a painting in a studio but there's some magic involved it's very, this is the most important place on earth at the moment to be creating. Thank you, George and Helen. We love you. <laughs> thanks, David. We love you too. And thank, thank you, you for allowing us to do this. Yeah, thanks. So, so much. Yeah, thank you, Jenya, George and Helen, David. Jenya, I'm yeah. a great lover of poetry. That it moved me profoundly. Yeah. In a thank you. Yeah, thank you. Move me too. Thank you, Jenny. 
Um, well, yeah, we could continue, but I know you two have salad greens to eat. <laughs> <laughs> one, of the, one of the problems is that we're, we're doing um, dispatches around the world. We're doing things for television, radio, newspapers, and particularly in Australia. Um, at, at, you know, so we had to do a radio show, for example, last night at one o'clock. Uh, in the 1 a.m. in the morning and um, so our sleep cycles everything's messed up but yeah. you know, fortunately you guys are not too late. Yeah. Thank you everybody. Thank you guys so much. Um, we encourage everyone to view our archive of the conversation um, on our YouTube channel um, which will be uploaded there shortly. Join us if you can tomorrow at 1 p.m. for a conversation um, with Raymond Foy and Lyle Rexler on uh, Jordan Belson. Um, and please, you can turn your microphones off uh, to say goodbye um, as you leave. Sorry, turn your microphones on. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you George. Thank you, Helen. Thanks, Jenny. Thank you. Thanks, George and Helen. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you, George. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Lovely voices. Thank you, Thank you everybody. I'll get some rest. Nothing was messed up about today. <laughs> please stay safe, George and Helen. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for joining everyone. Take care. Bye. Thanks, David. Bye. Thank you, David. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye.